Good morning to everyone. We've come to the house of the Lord for yet another time to worship Him. We've gone through the night and we have had a beautiful morning. And as we prepare our hearts to worship God, I, 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 I want to have a continuous teaching on the reason why we come to the house of the Lord. You know that God has created us, every single one of us, to worship Him. Did you know that? That's why we are created. So anytime we are not worshiping our Creator, then we are in violation of the reason we were created. Now all of us are to worship God individually. But there is a time that is set aside where we come together, we call it corporate worship, where we are bringing our gift of worship unto God. Now check this, when someone is coming to our homes, we make all sorts of preparation. You would clean out, would you? You would wash up this, you would make sure that everything is spick and span, so to speak. Because someone is coming to your home. When we come to God, as in, in, in this manner, we ought to prepare our hearts. We ought to be the very best that we are. To give Him all of the honor and all of the praise. And each week if I can I want to drive this home that the reason we are here is to worship God to give a gift of worship to God it's not for the good dressing up it's not for the nice smiles it is not for our friends it is to worship God it is a serious moment a reminder us that God inhabits the praises of his people it means that God lives in the praise of his people so it does not matter who you are little boy little girl take the teaching big people take the teaching it's not idle stuff it is active stuff that we have left our homes all of you so that we may praise and worship a God who has been good to us he has blessed us tremendously he has protected us he has kept us he has provided for us and all he asks is that we return praise and worship to him let's all stand please as we worship God
missing. When you tell someone else what's going on, sometimes they can't fix it. Sometimes they fix it for you, and then the one returns for fixing it for you. But when you tell the Lord, He fixes things. He fixes you up. So this morning, we get our desire. We will give Him our worship. We will give Him our praise. Because He is deserving of our worship and our praise. And I want to reiterate. I want to reiterate that. Young people, young people, I... This week, I hurt a lot. Because I see a nation on its way to hell. And I think of our own young people here at Kingston Baptist Church. And my heart aches. I pray for you. I want for you to just be in there with God. We have to stand in love. Oh, let's go all the time. Let's start with worshiping. When we come to the house of the Lord, let it not be another time. To stand up next to your parents or to stand up next to your parents and to wait until 12 o'clock. But let it be a time for you to worship God and to give Him all. again, Lord, to praise and honor your holy name, Lord. Father, we want to thank you first of all for the protection, for the guidance, your blessings over our life, your mercy for making us to gather yet again in corporate worship of your name. Father, we just want to exalt you. We just want to magnify your precious Alleluia. holy name, Lord, for everything that you have done for us from Monday thank up to God. this moment, Lord. Father, we say, hallowed be your holy name. Father, King of glory, we commit today's service into your mighty care, Lord. Father, we ask that as praises go up, Lord, blessings will come down upon us. Father, we ask that hearts will be receptive unto the word that will be ministered today, Lord. Father, that lives will be touched and at the end, all glory shall be given unto your name. Father, we ask that the word that is going to be preached today, we ask that hearts will be acceptable unto it, O Lord, that at the end all glory shall we continue to give unto your precious holy name, Lord, for in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Come on, just open your mouth and worship Jesus in the room this morning. Open your mouth and worship Jesus in the room. Hallelujah. You have to say something. Somebody say something to the master. You can just say thank you. You can just say I love you. You can just say you are worthy.
everyone have their own crowns. To some it's depression, to some it's worries. To some it's friends, to some it's family, to some it's money. Whatever your crown is, just lay it aside for 30 seconds. And we came to worship Him. These words are simple words. You don't need to look at the screen, you don't need to look at anybody. Just somebody in the room, just throw your hands up in the air and just worship Him for yourself. That accident, that could have been you, there and gone. Whisper to Him and say,
Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. He gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
today to tell you that God has turned my life around. I didn't really want to be a Christian. I wanted to be a carnival star. As a matter of fact, every pan out as a young boy, I did it. Calypso shows, chicken in the band back then, it was when you had ropes around the band and pan and so forth. But I did it. Had other people there with me, of course. In a gutter, as a young boy, the sun shining on my face. Drunk, not from rum, but from tiredness. Partying in the carnival crowd. But hallelujah, God picked me up. And look, I'm not going to say who and I started writing the song because we wanted to be king of Calypso. We started writing a song called Fire Down Back Street. And we started practicing Fire Down Back Street. But then our mom heard the song before anyone else did. And she said, The only fire getting down back street is this one. God picked me up and He turned me around. I used to be bright, like bulb. Only first place I knew in primary school. And then I passed to go to grammar school. And guess what? My life changed over a ball, a Wembley ball. I kicked that, listen, anywhere that ball was, I was. And I forgot everything about, I couldn't care less about education. Just let me follow the ball. And let the crowd follow me because I'm talking and I'm kicking the ball. Soon, I repeated and I made it to form four. And you know what they said, Mother? Everybody else in the family, right? But you had to have a black sheep. That is the black sheep. I was meant to be the black sheep, but let me tell you this I stand here today. I'm not going to go, go into accolades and certificates and all of that. I'm a very humble person. You don't hear me say much, but I can open any door. I could speak to any king. I could do anything. Nothing is too, too much for me to learn. I don't want to brag, but I'm a really bright man. That's the most I can tell you. I don't want to brag, and Cap, you can edit this out. Yes. Get 20 places and make money. Yes. God has been awesome to me. He has picked my life up and He has turned it around for a purpose. Why am I saying all this this morning? I didn't really plan to, you know. But somebody needed to hear this. That no matter who you are, God can pick you up and He can turn you around. You're not at your lowest. You may be called the black sheep. You may be called.
worshiping God in the Word, and I just want you to remain standing as we have our scripture reading. Hallelujah! reading today is taken from James 5 verses 7 to 20 NIV. Be patient then brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who, spro who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need, all you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church and pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Here ends the scripture reading. As Pastor Richards comes, this seems it's just one refrain of this chorus. Come, Pastor Richards, let every hallelujah, let every glad refrain by the King of Glory.
seconds and thank God for something. It could be the fact that you just graduated. You could thank God for your daughter that would have been dead and gone. You could thank God for your mom. You could thank God for your father. You could thank God for your wife, for your husband, for your child. Just thank God for one thing. just a moment, 10 seconds, someone just worship him. You don't need words to worship him, just keep saying hallelujah. say this is the word of God thus said the Lord my expectation therefore is that as we as we go through the time of um, teaching the word of God um, I will just show you this is the word of God all right and um, just make sure that it is well understood that's not really up to me anyway that I, I can deliver it but it is the Holy Spirit that will bring the enlightenment. And um, I think that what once we have the word of God and we endeavor now to go and live the word of God, we will be doing well. So when I stopped the last time, I was in the um, book of James, obviously, in chapter 4. Uh, and we had stopped at verse 6. I'm going to pick up at verse 7. But this time around, I'm going to ask that all of you, Whatever app you have, that you show it up on the app. Uh, well, if you can read it from the app or if you have the hard copy of your Bible, with you read from it and keep it right there. Um, also to help us, I'm going to ask the um, gentleman who is heading up or lady um, who is heading up the projection. Um, when I get to a verse, you, you follow with me. When I get to the verse in James, project it on the screen. I don't want anybody to miss the word of God. I really believe best thing that we could ever have is the word of God I really really believe that and sometimes we overcomplicate the gospel in preaching and you know there's fantastic preaching and stuff and but when you really strip it down you ask yourself what I'm concerned about is how much of the preaching has the word of God and that matters to me so for expository preaching there's a heavy 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 content this is the word of God um, so verse 7, if you can put that up on the screen. Verse 7. Um, so he says in verse 7, James, he picks up right there, he says, Submit, uh, uh, is it on the screen as yet? Is it, sub, is it is, uh, projected on the screen? Okay, um, so let me just say this again. Gwen, if you are listening to me, tell the gentleman or lady that is doing this that I will want the verse from James on the screen every time I read it, okay? So um, verse 7. Um, and, and that gentleman or lady will need to follow. So every time I move from to a new verse, I will want to see it. Very good. Um, they, he's using the King James Version, but I'm using the New International. Well, I'm using the Revised. I think. Submit yourself, it says, to God. Resist the devil, and uh, he will flee from you. James is writing to Christian people and it surprises me well, I ought not to be surprised but it surprises well yeah it surprises me that you have to tell Christian should you have to tell Christian people to submit themselves to God I mean really why should a Christian man like yourself or why should a Christian woman like yourself require a biblical injunction to submit yourself to God ought you not to know that as a Christian person 
that you do submit yourself. So God, it seems to me, therefore, that unlike what I would take for granted, that the reality in Christian life is that there are Christian people who just don't submit themselves to God. And they just stop for a moment and think about that. Don't submit themselves to God. So James makes it very clear in this injunction, submit yourself to God. Then he, he um, juxtapositions, he puts the two together, these two thoughts. One, the juxtaposition between submitting yourself to God and then resisting the devil. So he says here, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So those two thoughts must go together. On the one hand, the Christian person, you, I'm talking to you, you have to have this attitude in you of submitting to God, which means losing a sense of, I want to do this for myself. And uh, to clarify, because I just took it for granted that you know what submit to God means. To submit to God means that God has an authority that God has a sovereignty. Let me say that again. That God has an authority, that God has a sovereignty, and everything that you will do in your life will be guided by the authority and the sovereignty of God, such that if God says it, you don't question it, you just do it. Such that if God says it, you don't question it, you just do it. Let me say that again, because it's worth repeating. Such that if God says it, you don't question it you just do it and it seems that James is saying Christians are a long way off this whole matter of submitting themselves to God it seems to me that God will say things that Christian people just don't do so you are to when you read this word don't read it too quickly you are to when you read this word ask yourself are there things in the Word of God that I am NOT doing that I'm disobedient to maybe James is speaking to you this morning my dear brother maybe James is speaking to you this morning my dear sister that there are things that in your life that you need to bring under the submission of the Word of God that there are things in your life that you have to now begin to line up so that they come under the authority of the Word of God this is a serious message this is what it means to actually be a Christian. To submit yourself to God. And while you are doing that, again, the, the very obvious juxtaposition between submitting yourself to God and fleeing from the devil. He says, resist the devil. The idea here, or the notion here, is that the devil is the one that is robbing you of this submissiveness to God. Let me say that again. The devil robs you of a spirit, a spirit of submissiveness to God. What you have to do is to resist him. And then, what, in fact, when you dig into that language, or we say you unpack that word, it actually means not so much that you resist him, and that's it. But you have to, actually the word means you have to keep on resisting the devil till he gets the message. Uh, it might be like this for some people let me show you what I mean for some people carnival um, every time you know the carnival comes around there's an urge there's a tendency there's a, a desire you get caught up in the music it happens it happens um, the merriment of the time there's an energy uh, trust me especially after they finish circling the town there's an energy that draws people in I get that but there are some people who just don't ever get drawn into this it's just just and, and the reason why is that um, maybe at first they felt the tender second and third and, but after a while I have to keep on resisting okay I have to keep on resisting it is as if there's not an urge there to do the thing anymore so even sitting in this church this morning there are some people who for whom that is a real temptation and the devil will get you there but there are some other people for whom that's no real issue that's because you have resisted the thing over and over. Whether it is sexual behavior, sexual appetite, or, or just anything. If you, guys, if you, if you resist the devil on the thing, on the matter, you, that's not going to be a temptation there for you anymore. So to, to, to go with what James is saying here, he says keep on fighting it. In other words, keep on fight. Resist means keep on fighting off the devil. There might be an area in your life, whether it's pornography, 
or whether it is cheating or lying or gambling or woman, womanizing, man, I could go down the road. There, there might be an area of your life where you actually, this word is for you. You need to fight off the devil in that area. And if you fight off the devil in the area that he's getting to you, then he will flee there. All right. Let me go to verse 8. The word of God. Verse 8. Remember what I said? Let's, let's, I mean, you might even want to call it preaching. It's just the word of God. And it's okay for me if we just read the word of God and do what the word of God says. Verse 8. Verse 8 says now, continue with the same theme. Verse 8, verse 8, verse 8, verse 8, please. Verse 8. Oh, it takes a while to switch, okay? But just that you know verse 8, get ready and have verse 8 lined up. And then while you get verse 8 lined up, get verse 9 lined up. Um, whoever is up on the technology, um, Jenna or... Anthony, nudge them and say, I want verse 8, please, all right? So how long does it take for um, verse 8 to come up on the screen? Because I want to, I want to read it while it's on the screen, so I don't know how I can prompt this. Um, or maybe we just need to up our technology so that we can have it on the screen the same time. It's, um, I didn't know it was that much rocket science. I, Forgive me for my ignorance. All right, then it's not going to come up, so I'm going to just go ahead and read. Verse 8 Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. This is very, very harsh language indeed. And I'll come to I'll come to the reason why he's using this kind of harsh language. But um, some he is calling Christians sinners, not because they have not been saved from Adam's original sin, but because they continue though they have been saved from Adam's original sin. Hear me? Even all of us in here, even after we have been saved from sin, don't you know that we continue sinning? Such that Paul once asks in. Um, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 he actually asks shall we continue in sin that grace may abound God forbid and then in verse 4 he says if we are saved from sin how shall we continue to live in it any longer so what we ought to be doing is to have this Christian attitude where we draw near to God and you say well pastor what does James mean draw near to God no you have to be very careful draw near to God we have to have this attitude and we have to have this stance of drawing near to God. Now again, the relationship therefore between, follow, follow James here, I might get all done today but I'll get what I can done. The relationship between man and God is such that man has to, follow me, man has to draw near unto God. God wants relationship with us but God will not intrude our space and force himself on us. So the relationship between any man and any woman is con and God is contingent on how much you want God. So those who have a close relationship, follow me, those who have a close relationship with God are those who are drawing themselves to God. The song um, that I heard sung this morning, first off the bat, I loved it. Draw me close to you. You are all I want. You are all I need. A man or a woman, you in this church, you complain about your relationship with God, but it is not on God, it's on you. You will find that the people who draw close to God find that God is close to them. Let me say this again. You will find that the people who draw close to God find that God is close with them. And you will find that the people who have distanced themselves from God, they have distanced themselves from God, God seems distant from them. So James is on point. Draw near to God. And when you do that, he will draw near unto you. Draw near unto God. How do you draw near to God? I mean, for me, sometimes it is just simply plain. And, and I, have a, I have a choice between the kind of music that I listen to. I have a choice. So if I want to have this God feeling, when I say this God feeling, this feeling of the warmth of God, the closeness of God, thoughts of God, meditation of God, etc., etc., I, I make a choice. 
I make a choice to connect with God through songs. Love doing that. Um, readings, I make a choice to what I read, connect myself with God. Even postings, and there are some postings that will drive my thoughts away from God, and there are some postings that will, um, social posting, that will drive my thoughts towards God. I make the choice that I want those postings that will drive my thoughts towards God because I have a biblical injunction that says, draw nigh to God. It is upon me, the onus is upon me, therefore, to be reaching out in, in my communication, in my prayer life. I have to have conversations with God regularly. I have to talk with God regularly. I have to talk about God regularly. And I find that if I do that, I have a sense, a feeling that God is with me. The Bible is right. If you draw near to God, you feel his presence near you. You have to do that. It is not on God. The very thing that he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. Now let me say that again. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there. He's referring to corporate worship. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I am there. But then you have people who rather than draw towards where God is, where he promised in his word that he is there to bless, mind you, he says, rather than, rather than run towards that, rather than gravitate towards that, rather than yearn and thirst and hunger for the time when we can meet corporately together like this so that we can meet with God. Would you believe that there are people who disdain that, who have no time for that, who will make the simplest excuse I mean, there are people who will say that they're tired from this and tired from that and all of these other things. So I made a post yesterday. I said, uh, listen, make time for God because somehow you managed to make time for everything else in your life. Let me say this again, what I said. Make time for God because somehow you managed to make time for everything else. Draw close to God. It's upon you. And it's as if you want to do it. This is the word of God. Verse 9. Verse 9, I don't know if you have it ready. I'm going to go ahead. When you get it ready, put it up. Be miserable and moan. <laughs> verse 9, I, have, I read verse 9 many, 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 many times because I was like, why is that there? Why is that there? I'll read it. And, 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 because if I stop there, it doesn't make sense until you read further on. So I might leave verse 9 until I get further. But let me read it. Be miserable and moan and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Hmm. So what is he saying that he wants us to be sad? What's going on with this? But what he's talking about, and you don't get it until you get to verse 5, um, chapter 5, excuse me, when you begin to get a sense of the fact that when people have distanced themselves to God, from God and yet continue with a frivolous lifestyle something is incongruous it's not right it's wrong it's out of place he says back up get sober and rather than all of your um, reveling and your frivolity and all of the cackling and jokes and everything you have sober yourself and rather than laughing if you realize where you stood right now with God you should be crying I'll come back to that. It's, he brings it up later, so I'll come back to that. Verse 10, verse 10. So he goes back to where he began in verse 7, and he says, Humble yourselves in the presence of God, and he uh, will exalt you. The injunction from James here is very clear. Verse 7, verse 8, and verse 10 seems to be calling on Christian people. There seems to be a problem here that Christian people have elevated themselves, that Christian people have elevated their desire, desires, that Christian people have elevated their own comforts and consider these as priority over God. And he says, if you begin to put God first, if you begin to put God first, he is going to exalt you. He shifts gears in verse 11. Um, and comes back to an old theme, one that he picked up in chapter 1, verse 18, I think, and one that he picked up in all of chapter 3. In verse 10, he says, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. And, excuse me, verse 11, Do not speak against one another, brethren. 
he who speaks against a brother or judges a brother speaks against the law and judges the law but if you judge the law you are not a doer of the law but a judge of it verse 12 there is only one lawgiver and judge the one who is able to save and to destroy but who are you to judge your neighbor and he stops there now this is a very serious matter remember what i said at the top um word of god word of god and word of god is way to live your christian life and uh, you this is basically how you know yeah i'm I'm, on, I'm in a groove as a christian he said it again this is how you know yeah i'm in a groove as a christian now i ask myself why is it in one short book one that you could read in like about 20 minutes james three different times in this book james is saying watch what you say watch what you say watch what you say apparently um christian people have a problem with what they say and i now get it when i i mean you don't quite get it when you read chapter one when he says be slow to speak be, be quick to hear and slow to speak that's what he says in chapter one and then when he when he gets to chapter three he says blessings and cursing should not flow from the same mouth bitter and sweet can come from the same fountain but even then it didn't really hit home it is only now that we get to verse 12 of chapter 4 that it is really clear what james is saying james is saying you all have a problem among you christian people you all have a problem among you so let me not preach let me just read the word of god and tell you what it says it says do not speak against one another it's plain and simple there that's a sermon right there you could go home and i didn't preach it is the word of god you all stop talking against one another this is the word of god as a christian brother it does not behoove me to speak against another christian brother or christian sister the word of god tells me stop talking against one another against it didn't tell me stop talking about it just says stop talking against a serious word we are not forbidden from talking about a brother we are not forbidden from talking about a sister we are just warned that if we should talk about a brother or a sister it should not be negative talk can we say amen in the house of God well it's, you know, it's just teaching moments so it's just teaching all right if I was preaching you might have said amen there's something fundamentally wrong brothers and sisters there is something fundamentally wrong with saying a bad word against my brother or my sister amen this does not rule out rebuke which matthew chapter 19 18 lays out for us how we should rebuke people we should go to them directly and if they don't hear we should um, take somebody with us and if they don't hear we should take elders of the church and if they don't hear da 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 right so this is not ruling out rebuke this is not ruling out what Galatians says. If a brother be found in a fault, which brothers and sisters will be found in fault? We are Christian people. We are imperfect people. We are Christian people. I need to remind us of this. We are Christian people, but we are imperfect people. Even Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I should um, not be doing, that I do. He actually says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12 and verse 13, verse 14, he says, I want to be up there for God, but I'm not there yet. He keep, he's saying, I've not even obtained it. I am not where I want to be. I am imperfect, he said, but forgetting the things that are behind, I will push towards the things that are ahead. So my Christian reality is that, and I know fully well that my Christian brothers and my Christian sisters are not perfect. It seems like some people think they are, but I know my Christian brothers and my Christian sisters are not perfect there are imperfections in each and every one of us some of them very glaring some of them very aggravating but we need to and, and this is a very good verse we need to back off this position of the expectation of Christian perfectionism can I say it again we need to back off this position of the expectation of Christian perfectionism where we keep judging brothers and sisters and from the minute they slip from the mark of perfection we let them have it in fact we don't even let them have it to their face 
but we speak against them according to what James is saying we speak against them and I get the impression here one with another and verse 11 you're still there verse 11 I'm still on verse 11 you're ahead of me now oh you're picking up some speed I'm still on verse 11 verse 11 I'm still on verse 11 shout him and tell him verse 11 please verse 11 I'm still on verse 11 verse 11 is there I know I'm in 11 speak not evil against one another that's where I am so verse 11 is just coming up I read 11 and 12 and then I went back to 11 because 11 and 12 is what we call a pericope and a pericope is a piece of nugget of scripture that is like sliced up together it's like a piece of cake so to take the whole pericope that was 11 and 12 I had to read 11 and 12 but I want to go back to 11 verse 11 the first part says don't speak negative evil against one another I don't even want to get off this point until we get it you don't you can't you're not supposed to it does not say one another won't fall it does not say one another won't mess up everybody knows that but there's a there, there is a, a, a what a protocol in the scripture for how you deal with people who mess up and the protocol does not include speaking evil against them as rubbing salt in the wound we have to change. we have to become Christians we have to become Christian by living what the Word of God says no sense we come to church preach great sermons but so I prefer to just read what the Word of God says and say go live it we cannot speak against one another who slip and fall and all of that we can't the, the, the pattern is talk to them about it the, and in Matthew the pattern in Galatians if they be found in a fault if they be found in a fault if they be found in a fault restore them it doesn't say put them down it says restore them gently gently make it make sure that it's gentle make sure that it is gentle in the way you do it it something stirs in me I guess it doesn't happen often that you come and tell me bad things about one another I guess you because you know what I would say but every now and again I pick up on, on Christian bad talking other Christian one thing you never ever do you never cut down your own so whether they're from different church or wherever ever you still your own don't cut them down and worse yet if they only belong to your family here yeah? this is craziness it's only somebody who bad-minded against a family would cut down their own family oh I'll say it again it's only if you're bad-minded and you don't love your family you will cut them down everybody out there know how to keep family secret and cut and, and, and nudge you until your family get back together why don't we church people we have to learn that too and they say coming from me it is coming from the Word of God do not speak against one another way around with you you know what the father says it says if you're doing that this is what you're doing if you're doing that and it mentions the law basically what it says you're holding them to the letter of the law and it's like you so perfect in the law and you know the whole law and everything you're just judging them according to what they should do and what they shouldn't do people will do things they shouldn't do and there are things they should do that they won't do but what this passage is very clearly saying it is not giving a pass for people who mess up don't get me wrong it is not giving you a pass but it is, uh, it is saying look people are going to do what they shouldn't do and the things they should do they won't do so they will mess up on the law that's why he's talking about law here he's talking about law so he says well you know you, you speak against the brother you judge him um, against the law in other words you hold up the standard of the law and you take your brother and sister and say boy watch out this is the standard where you should be in the law and look where you there boy or look where you there. so you judge them according to the law right you go to verse 12 now and he says well but, but uh, what let me put verse 12 in fancy language first what he basically saying is that who died and made you God that's exactly what he's saying he says there's only one law giver there's only one man there's only one who is perfect when it comes to the law and if you name God then you're in a position to judge other people but what he's saying I'm putting it in my language but this is really what he means he says unless you name God shut him out okay no you say pastor no read it from what he says it says 
There was only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge? In other words, who are you? In other words, who are you? You name God? There's only one. He says there's only one. There's only one. And you're trying to put yourself. That's what, I mean, this is what he's saying. You're trying to put yourself in the place of God when you bad talk your brother or your sister. We just need to stop it. There is no good. There is no good whatever. There is no good whatsoever when a brother is in a fault or a sister is in a fault. There is no good whatsoever in bad talking them with somebody else or pointing out the error to somebody else. There is a biblical way to do that. And the biblical way to do that is to talk with them on their own and then bring one if they don't hear and then bring two or three and others and so on. And even when you do that, the biblical pattern is do it gently. If you're going to have an intervention, don't have an intervention that they feel mash up when they finish. Have an intervention where it is gentle and restorative. Restorative rather than punitive. Let me get off that because there are a few more verses. Um, he says, verse 13, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life I'm doing a whole pericope right now okay so all of it okay so I'll come back up to verse 13 but I'm doing the entire pericope verse 14 um, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow you who are just if you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away instead you are to say if the Lord wills we will live and also do this or that that's what you're supposed to do verse 16 but as it is you boast in your own arrogance all such boasting is evil therefore no one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it but to him is this a sin so what he does here in this last pericope of chapter 4 where he begins in bookend, we, we use the term bookend in theology, where you begin a pericope with a thought, then you have some things in the middle, and then you end. And there's like, uh, you know, books in between, and you have a bookend there, a bookend there, so it doesn't fall down. So his first bookend was, submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to God. And then he closes this pericope with, you have arrogance the way you live. You talk as if there is no God. You carry yourself as if you are your own God. You make all kind of plans and you leave God out. That's what he's saying. He's saying in everything therefore that we do, whether it's business deal or travel or everything, we should acknowledge the preeminence of God. We should ask if it is God's will. We can't just take control of our lives as if we are in charge. And leave God on the periphery and invite him in only when we get in trouble so we are traveling it's only when the plane start going through turbulence that you might remember to say Lord please be with me now or you get there and there's an issue with your credit card and it just doesn't work you say God please please help me to get this worked out James is basically handling a very sensitive matter within Christianity in which Christian in their they don't don't miss this huh? these last set of verses Christians in their regular daily living unconsciously because it is not that we consciously do it but in our daily living what we do as Christian is that we just go about living and we don't really include God in everything you follow what I'm saying here God is not front and center of our thoughts I mean, when we are in church, we think of God. Or when we, um, when, when else do we think? When we in Bible study, we think of God. And, uh, but like when you down the road or when you entertaining or whatever, I mean, how much is God really in your thoughts? So James is really pushing hard against this thing that's going on with Christian, where God only at convenient times is at front and center, but everything else, when we go about our jobs really no God there really no God 
you're busy, you work hard. I'm not, I don't have a problem with people who work hard, industrious people. We have, we have sharp people in this church. You hear me? Sharp. We have bright people in this church. We have industrious people in this church. We have hard working people. We have professionals of all walks of life in this church. I commend you. I commend you. But in doing your do, in doing your do, this is the injunction. You remember you're a Christian and God is in the midst of it. In doing your do, I mean, just be sure that it is done on the deeper view of God. I wish I had time to go into chapter 5 to show you how he really gets at the Christians who... Give me five minutes to do it. Give me five minutes to do it. Five minutes and I'll... Because, um, and if you are running the control up there, go to my notes um, where I talk about self, this and self, that and self, the other. Okay, let's go to my notes. Um, because I want to show you what... James is really digging at here. Five minutes and then I'll complete it. He's at, at the first case. Um, I don't know if you can cascade and cause him to drop one after the other. If you can, that's fine. But he's, he's saying, look, um, you have a sense of complacency. You're not asking, you're saying, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And tomorrow I'm going to be here. You're very complacent. You figure that everything is about you and as a result of your effort. You're forgetting what Luke chapter 12 and verse 17 says. The rich guy in Luke chapter 12 and verse 17 thought it was all his work. He was complacent in what he could accomplish. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 10 to 20 says, If you think your success is all about you and you forget God, God will curse you. So anybody here who is leaving God out, there's a curse there. There's a curse there, man. You can't, you can't even, even simple mundane thing. I will go here, I will go there. I will do this, I will do that. No, you can't do that. Second thing is this matter of self-indulgence, which I see coming out um, in these last few verses there. Self-indulgence. This is what I'm going to do. This is about me. I will go, I will have fun in the city. I will do my business. First Timothy chapter 6. You can write these down. First Timothy chapter 6, 17 and 18. Um, and this Basically, he says um, the opposite of that. If you have means, um, don't fatten yourself off what you have. You have to read it. I don't have time to dig into it. But First Timothy chapter 6, 17 and 18 says, if you have means, if you're well to do and all of that, don't fatten yourself off that. Don't make it all about you. Yes, you work hard for it. Yes, you did. A, yes, other people were lazy. Yes, that, yes, that. But verse 18 actually says, with what you have, and with what you have been blessed with, do good. And if you won't consider yourself rich, what it says is that you have to be rich in good deeds. And you, once you make out in life, you have to be generous and willing to share. I love Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 28 because it speaks to me and not to you. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 28 says, when people come to you asking for anything, don't run them off. And tell them come back at a different time. Like you have a fifty dollars to let me. Oh boy, I wish I had that. No, no. If you come back next week or some other time, I, I, you know what I mean. Somebody comes to beg you, a beggar comes up to you and say, "Give me a dollar." It's like I really have that right now. Of course you have it. There are times people ask you to do things, but because you don't really feel the urge to, as you are fully able. By the way, you are fully capable of helping them, but for your own reasons, you just don't want to. So you say, "Go, go on, wheel and come again." Because you want to use it for yourself and not for others. The third one is self-advancement. And then after this, two more. I said five minutes, I have to take five minutes. The third one is self-advancement. This thing about Christian, we, we have to bear in mind that we are talking about Christian people. We have to correct these things. Eh? We have to correct these things. Nothing is wrong. You don't get me. I'm a very progressive guy. You see me here. Very, very progressive. Um, and I want to go further all the time. Ambitious? Yes, I am ambitious. Eh? I love people around me who have ambition. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I deal with a lot of progressive people, bright people in this church, and people who want to get ahead. I like that. I like that very much. But we have to be very careful with the notion of advancing ourselves. You bright scholars and you entrepreneurs and you business people here, and you professionals, some of you doctors, a lawyer here and there, um, and, and, and manage, management people, 
Um, just hear me and hear me well. In trying to get up the ladder and get ahead, chase after things. Remember, with all that you gain, you can take it with you. Don't leave God out of the thing. James chapter 5 and verse 2 and verse 3 says, it is not worth he says, actually, as you read chapter 5, he says, it ain't worth it going after these things and amassing your titles, your head of this, you have this degree behind your name. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 11 and the rest of chapter 2 says, it is a waste of time when you have all of that. It will leave you empty. Don't leave God out. First Timothy chapter 6, 9 and 10 says, it will plunge you into destruction if you leave God out. This penultimate one, self-importance verse 13 that parochopy you say I'm going to the city and you kind of big up yourself I'm going there traveling and doing this and doing that not so much if God wills not so much if God wants me not so much God use me when I'm there not so much thinking God first but this whole self-importance look at me I traveling I doing this I doing that we make all these kind of plans for education and for um, business ventures. We plan well. I know. I know you. I know God's people. Um, we plan well for everything. We really plan well for everything that concerns us. We plan well for everything that concerns us. But the, 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 the amazing thing is that there, there doesn't seem to be this translation into planning well for the things that concern God. But I leave you with this. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says, Seek as a priority. Please, Christian people. What we need, are you getting this? How, 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 what we're supposed to do is seek as a priority the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There's no other way um, for a Christian to live his or her life unless they are seeking after God and his righteousness as a priority. What they saying is put kingdom business first. Things that relate to God, his work, his church, his people. Prioritize these things, please. Let me say that. Can I say that again? Please, because I don't know that we get it. That this is the Christian life, you know. This is the Christian life. Things that relate to God. Things that relate to his work, his church, his people. Kind of give that a little oomph. Give that a little attention. Give that a little something, please. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 is worth reading again. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Put God's stuff first rather than things that pertain to you first. It is okay therefore to put off things for God. There's a plea on my heart. I, it just pains me to watch Christian. It pains me. And I'm a mere man, but it pains me to watch people put their things going on first and make time. They make time for everything. They even take God-given resources and use it on themselves and have a very hard time using it for the kingdom of God. I really think, put a mark at it, I think Christian people really need to do a revisit of whether or not they have God, kingdom and God's work as priority. I know you missed um, Wednesday night when I spoke about idolatry, um, but if you got the notes, you would see that it is a big matter with God when we put other things and other people in our lives first. Last one. I exceed in my five minutes. My apologies. Last one. Self-direction. Self-direction is basically, well, you, you, you read it there. Verse 13, verse 14, verse 15, verse 16, verse 17. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do, go to the city. I'm going to, uh, everything. I am going to do this. I'm going to do that. And basically, we are living outside of God's will. God's will ought to be preeminent. In our lives this is what James is saying in James chapter 5 1 to 6 Judges chapter 21 verse 25 I'm almost on be patient Judges chapter 1 verse 25 says everybody did what seemed to be right in their own eyes everybody did what was right in their own eyes and I can't help but think that in this 21st century um, church where nobody could tell even pastoral authorities question frankly speaking 
biblical authority is questioned every authority everybody is a law unto themselves and everybody is an authority unto themselves almost so the kind of the kind of collusion and collaboration that you ought to have with church people you don't really have that I mean you really don't have that and people in the eyes of those who are leading sometimes people seem to be doing they live the Christian life how they feel like they do what it doesn't matter what the pastor says from the pulpit but forget the pastor because that's not important it doesn't matter what the word of God says and even if the pastor says but it says this it says this it says this people are not willing to really adhere as much to the corporate um, direction people want to do what is right in their own eyes church hear me this is the word of God God's people are moving towards a culture church people you hear me young people you listen to me God's people are moving towards a culture where everybody wants to do what is right in their own eyes and there's no real spiritual authority over them even the divine mandate and the divine plan of the that God has given with the shepherd being Christ and the under shepherd and the sheep supposed to follow the shepherd that is a disgust to many people even the shepherd's voice is basically, if I want to do that, I will do it. If I don't want to, don't. Who, who are you to come and tell me what to do? Uh, you know, so, uh, but um, that, that is the matter here. A disregard for authority where people are doing what is right in their own eyes. But I will end now. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but he ends thereof the ways of that. This is the word of God today. The word of God today has been a mouthful. I'll stop there. The word of God today has been a mouthful. But what I try to present to you, I try to present to you what's in the word of God, um, the, the main themes that James is hitting. And he says, Christian people, you have to learn to just bring yourself under the authority of God and the sovereignty of God. If God says it, then you have to do it. Then he says, look, you have the second main theme in the second paragraph. The second theme was, we have to be careful how we talk about people who fail. Now, mind you, mind you, he's, he's talking about people who mess up and do wrong. Eh? He says you can't talk negative about them even so. You cannot speak negative about them. And then the third theme that he really addresses in this, he says, look, you're full of self. Everything is about you. Self-indulgence, self -indulgence, self self-direction, self-importance, self-everything. And he says, that ought not to be. My brothers and sisters, if you have found yourself, excuse me, sir. my brothers and sisters, if you have found yourself where you are living outside of the will of God, where these things are concerned, you are for the word of God and you ought to live in obedience to the word of God. Shall we bow our heads, please, at this time? And so, Almighty God, we thank you for your word that has gone forth. Father, we pray that you would uh, use uh, this word today to the direction of your spirit um, to speak to our hearts. Father, how we need to bring our lives into congruence to live the authentic Christian life according to your word. Your word has been so simple today. To help us to examine our lives in the light of your word and to resolve to go from this place to be obedient unto your holy word through Christ our Lord.